Last week I mentioned uh, Kenyan's Eliud Kipchoge's. He is the, the world record holder for the marathon. It was a time he set last year in Berlin. But that wasn't the fastest that this guy has run 26.2 miles. In 2019, he ran that distance in a time of one hour, 59 minutes and 40 seconds, becoming the first marathoner ever to break that two-hour barrier. It was an absolutely incredible achievement. A while back, I saw some video clips of some people trying to run on a treadmill at the pace that Kipchoge ran those 26 miles at. And they just couldn't keep up, even for a couple of seconds, and they went flat on the treadmill. I know you're not supposed to laugh when people do that, but it was quite funny. But this time that he set, of under two two hours, has not become the world record for a marathon. And that's because the conditions for this run were carefully engineered to make that time possible. So they chose a route along the, the river Danube that was extremely flat. They also chose a day in which the, the weather would just be ideal for running. Not too hot, not too cold, not windy. A car guided them on the road, setting the pace for the run. A cyclist cycled alongside, supplying a carbohydrate-rich drink. And there were no other competitors But instead he ran with an elite group of distance runners, which took turns, because nobody could keep up with them all the time, took turns as pace setters. And they ran in this kind of strange uh, uh, formation, which was supposed to be a wind-blocking formation. It's kind of like a, you know, the geese flying with it in a V, but kind of the opposite of that. So there's Kipchoge in the white in the middle, kind of protected from the wind to allow him to run at this speed. So he could say he was was cheating. But even if we did all of that, none of us could do that. So it was still an impressive run. But it does show how choosing the right route, running in the best conditions, and and having the right support around us can really help us to run. Can make a difference. And that's not just the case for running. It's a case for us too. If we are going to run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, that life of faith in Jesus right to the end, then we can't just run any old way. We too need better conditions and the right support and the right encouragement from others. And that's what the writer of Hebrews goes on to teach us in Hebrews chapter 12. So we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12 to 17, and Caroline's going to come up and she's going to read it for us. Thank you, Caroline. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights at the old son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Thank you very much, Caroline. Last week we were encouraged to submit to God's training program. To allow God to use even the hardships of our lives to help us to grow in our relationship with God and our dependence on Him. But this process of growing is not a passive process. We are invited to be partners with God in our development. To actively pursue our spiritual growth. 
And in this passage, I think there's five ways in which we need to do this. And these are both our responsibilities as individuals, but also corporately as a church together. God wants us to work on those things together. And as often as the case in this letter, this writer points back to the Old Testament to help us to see this. So first of all, we need to overcome despondency. Verse 12. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Now, feeble arms and weak knees. Uh, He's not saying anything about our bodies here, of course. But this is a common picture in the Old Testament of exhaustion, of discouragement, of despair. It's when you feel like you just can't keep going. You can't go another step. You've had enough. And the reality is that any of us can get like that. Isaiah 40, verse 30 says this, Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. No matter how enthusiastic or energetic we may be, life can drain us. The opposition that we face can be so fierce. Our struggle against sin in our lives can just wear us down. Or the pain of illness or disappointment can be intense. And after a while it can feel like we just can't go on. We've had enough. But we don't need to be defeated by that. Instead, we can strengthen our feeble arms and our weak knees. We can encourage ourselves, renew our spiritual vitality, find hope again in God. But how do we do that? How do we strengthen ourselves? How do we build ourselves up again? Well, this is not a challenge To pull ourselves together and grit our teeth and just get on with it. It's not a pull your socks up kind of encouragement. Rather this is an encouragement to look beyond ourselves. This call to strengthen feeble arms and weak knees actually comes from Isaiah 35 in the Old Testament. This is what it says, verse 3 to 4. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. So that's how we strengthen ourselves when we feel exhausted. We need to refocus On the Lord. Put our hope again in God. In His coming to sort out all of the injustice that we see around in the world. And on His ability to put things right. In His strength to bring us into the fullness of our salvation that He purchased for us when Jesus died on the cross. We find that renewed strength, not by looking within, but by looking up. This is what Isaiah 40 says. Yes, youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Today we can strengthen ourselves by putting our hope in the Lord. But we need help to do this. So the writer continued, verse 13. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather healed. Level ground is always easier to run on. 
As I mentioned, that's why they chose that route for Kipchoge's uh, record uh, running a marathon. Because running on uneven ground or on hilly conditions slows you down. I know all about that because I really, I regularly struggle up Spring Valley uh, at the end of my run and it kills me every time. So what is the level ground that we need to run in in our life of faith? Well, this quotation is again from the Old Testament. It's from Proverbs this time. Proverbs chapter 4. And the context of this helps us to understand what the writer was talking about. So this is what he says. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Do you see what he's saying? That level ground is about God's way for for our lives. It's about rejecting the way of evil and choosing God's way of holiness. Rejecting the way of this world and following Jesus. That's the level ground. That's what will enable us to keep on going. And that's so important because without it, Without holiness, as it says in verse 14, no one will see the Lord. Holiness is essential because God is perfectly holy. He is set apart from sin and evil. And so if we want to see God one day, then we also need to be holy. We also need to be completely set apart from this world of sin and evil. We also need to be set apart to belong to God and to live for God and to live like God. Of course, that seems impossible, doesn't it? How can we be holy? Knowing what we're really like, knowing our struggle with sin. Knowing with with all the stuff that goes on in our heads, never mind comes out of our mouths or, or that we end up doing. But the great news of the gospel is that as we saw last week, if we'll put our faith in Jesus, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. If we've trusted in Jesus, then Jesus has already done on the cross what we could never do for ourselves. He has made us holy. He has paid for our sin. He's cleansed us from our iniquity. He's dressed us in His righteousness. And He's set us apart as God's people. God's holy people. And one day, that will be fully realized in our lives. One day, we will be like Jesus. But for now, working through His Holy Spirit, God is transforming us. Progressively transforming us so more and more we live out this reality of who we already are. Not trying to become somebody we're not, but just living out the reality of who Jesus has already made us to be. As we were thinking about last week, he even does this through the hardships we go through. The really tough times that we experience. God disciplines us for our good. That we may share in his holiness. But this is not just something that God does for us. He wants us to pursue this with Him. We need to make every effort to be holy. Do everything we can to live out the reality that we are God's holy people. So daily, 
We need to reject evil. Refuse the temptation around us. Refuse to conform to the pattern of this world. Keep our eyes fixed ahead on the goal that God has for us. That one day Jesus is coming back for us so we can be just like him. And if we do that, we will increasingly live a life of holiness. This is how John put it in his letter. 1 John chapter 3. Now we are the children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. As we fix our eyes on that glorious day when we will be just like Jesus, it will empower us and enable us to live more and more that way through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But making this level path for our feet Choosing the way of holiness. Choosing God's way in our lives. Won't won't just transform our lives. It will also impact the lives of those around us. Do you see what he said in verse 13? Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather healed. The lame are those who are exhausted, who are crippled by spiritual discouragement. But if they are part of our community, if they are part of our church, a church that is pursuing holiness, then they will be encouraged by those around them. Their strength will be renewed. They will be spiritually restored. Sometimes, when we are struggling in our faith, our tendency is to pull away from our church. Pull away from fellowship. Pull away from spending time among Christians. We don't feel worthy to be here to worship God together. We're afraid it will just pull other people down. But that's when we really need our church community. When we are struggling, we really need each other. To encourage us. And to lift us up. So remember in chapter 10, verse 25, let us not give up meeting together. As some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another. We all need help and encouragement. And that's why it's so important that we make every effort to live in peace with all men. I wonder if you remember back in Hebrews chapter 7, I know it was a while, about, a while ago that we looked at that, we saw that Jesus is our great high priest in the order of this guy called Melchizedek. And his name meant king of righteousness and king of peace. And so those who are part of that kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus, are called to live in righteousness and peace. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, what we'll be able to avoid all conflict in our lives. Paul wrote this, If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. So sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes it's not up to us. Those who are part of his kingdom are called to live in righteousness and peace, but we can't be responsible for what other people do. We need to do everything we can while sticking with the truth to live in peace with everybody else. Now that's important in all of our relationships. Live at peace with everybody. But it's especially true in church. 
Through Jesus, God has united us together as one body. So we can live together as His children. And so we are called to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Be together in this. Not just try and do it on our own. Not just try and get on with it on our own. But stand together in this challenge. Stand together in, the, in our lives for Jesus. And that's important so that we honour the one who saves us, who have saved us. But it's also important so that we can encourage each other in the challenges we face. We need the support and the help and the ministry of the body of Christ. Like that guy Kipchoge, we cannot run this race on our own. We need each other. Book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says two are better than one. Because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and there's no one to help him up. Guys, we can't do this on our own. God has not gifted us, enabled us to do it on our own. We need each other. So we can encourage each other by overcoming despondency. By pursuing holiness. By maintaining harmony. But the opposite is also true. If we give up on God, if we choose to live immoral lives, then we will impact other people negatively. As an example of somebody who did do that, who gave up on God, the writer pointed to a guy called Esau, again from the Old Testament, says verse 16, see that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. As Isaac's firstborn son, Esau was due to receive a double portion of his father's inheritance and father's blessing. But one day, when he came in from being outside in the field, his brother Jacob was cooking some lentil stew. And Esau was hungry. He was famished. And so, in a ridiculous moment of short-term thinking and focusing on physical gratification, he sold his birthright to his younger brother for a bowl of stew. And it showed them, showed us the kind of man that Esau was. He was godless. He was immoral. He was unholy. He was worldly. He was irreverent. For Esau, his immediate physical desires were more important than future spiritual blessings. This was also demonstrated by his sexual immorality. Probably because he married Judith, daughter of Biri the Hittite, and also Basemath, daughter of Elon the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. These women from Canaan were steeped in idolatry. But Esau chose to marry them anyway. Based on his immediate physical desires. Rather than future spiritual blessings. That's how he made all his choices. What he felt like right now. What would help him right now. Rather than what would be worthwhile before God in the future. So later, when his brother Jacob tricked his dad into giving him that that blessing, Esau was absolutely devastated. But it was too late. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. His regret 
And his sadness over that situation could not take away the consequences of his foolish choices. He ultimately lost out because of his selfish and short-term thinking. And that's what the writer had been warning his readers not to do all through the letter. Don't make the same mistake by choosing a path in life that is easier. Perhaps more immediately enjoyable. But certainly safer. In the short term. But will lead to devastating loss in the long term. Do you remember in verse 12 of chapter 3? See to it, brothers, that none of us, none of you have a sinful heart, unbelieving heart, that turns away from the living God. Don't make choices today just based on what you feel like or what is easier or what your desires are. Instead, think about what will be beneficial long term. What will be the the spiritually more beneficial reality? Don't base our decisions on now that will lead to terrible loss in the future. Make your decisions now based on what will make sense, what will be worth it from the perspective of heaven. And that's not just because it will lead to personal disaster if we do that, if we turn away from God. But it will also lead to a community defilement. Look at verse 15. See to it that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. This idea of bitter root probably comes from Deuteronomy this time. Where the Lord said to the nation of Israel, Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you who's... today, whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of the nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. It's a call to the nation to make sure that nobody in that community turned away from God and turned to idolatry. Not just because that was important for each individual, but because it was important for the health of the community. God knew that if somebody walked away into idolatry, it would affect other people. That defilement would would spread. Be like a contamination. And it might lead others to follow that bad example. And in a similar way, the writer of Hebrews was warning these believers not to give up on Jesus. Not just because it would lead to disaster in their lives, but also because they might lead others. To follow their bad example. As fellow believers, we are connected to each other. What we do influences others. We can either be an encouragement or a discouragement. We can either build each other up or tear each other down. We can either help each other or we can hinder one another. So Paul wrote to Timothy, To set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. We can't just say, I'm just going to do my own thing. And everybody else is responsible for their own actions. No, we need to recognize we have an influence on others. For good or for bad. But just finally, how do we do all of this? How can we overcome despondency? How can we pursue holiness? How can we maintain harmony and reject defilement? So that we will encourage and not discourage each other in this race of faith. Well, there's just one final exhortation in this passage, right in the middle that we haven't mentioned yet. If you look at verse 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. 
sometimes when we focus on our responsibilities to run this race, we can fall into old habits of legalism or condemnation. We want to impose stricter rules and laws on our lives, thinking that that will help us to live a life of commitment to the Lord. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do this. Do that. And then when we stumble and fall, when we don't reach that standard that we set for ourselves, we beat ourselves up, thinking that we're so bad we'll never get there. But that's not how we run this race with perseverance, the race that God has marked out for us. And it's not how we help other people to do it. Not by going around and being the the policeman of everybody's life and saying, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that. Or condemning people for their struggles. That's not an encouraging community to be part of. Instead, each day, we are called to trust in to rest in, to depend on, to rejoice in the wonderful, amazing, outrageous grace of God. The unmerited, undeserved, unearned gift of salvation that comes through Jesus. The gift that we have received when we've just simply put our faith in Him because by one sacrifice He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. That's what we need to focus on. The wonderful grace of God. It's God's grace that will enable us to strengthen our feeble arms and weak knees so that we'll overcome despondency. And it's God's grace that will enable us to stick to those level paths so that we'll pursue holiness. And it's God's grace that will unite us together as one family so that we'll maintain harmony. And it's God's grace that will transform our hearts so that we'll reject defilement. This is what Paul wrote to Timothy, or to, sorry, to Titus. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us, the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our Lord, God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let's not miss the grace of God. That's what we need. Let's again fix our eyes on Jesus, our great God and Saviour. The one who loved us and gave himself up for us and declares to us that his grace is sufficient for us. His grace is enough to enable and empower and equip us to run this race with perseverance right to the end. To the glory of God.